Hi, welcome back to It's Not Easy Being Green. I'm Sean Henning. We've been talking about eco-psychology with Dr. Michael DeMaria. And one of the things that we had discussed that I wanted to bring up is the uh, effective environmental education. What, in your view, is effective environmental education? Great question. All these good questions. Effective ecological communication, or environmental education, is about anytime you've raised awareness and consciousness, understanding about a human relationship to their environment and vice versa, and realize that the environment is, um, and that's why I think this, when we talk about, when you talk about plant murder, yeah. you know, mass plant murder, that there's a feeling dimension to that education. When we raise conscious, sometimes we just think about it as a thinking level. Well, and I know a, I have a lot of friends who have said to me, well, you know, you know I, I don't think much about the environment. You know, somebody else is going to take care of that for me. And I'm kind of thinking that may stem from like the 70s where everybody really became more environmentally aware and then the EPA was created and some of these other things. And so now people kind of feel like, oh, they've handed that over to the government so they don't have to worry about it. But what are your thoughts on that? Oh, it's it's a huge mistake. And people, and, and psychologically, you see it. For 12 years now, I've been uh, working with taking people out into the wilderness for extended periods of time on wilderness experiences based upon Native American Vision Quest. And it's amazing when you get somebody out in the wilderness who's never been out in the wilderness before. And, and initially, there's some fear, there's uncertainty. Because what's strange is people in our culture become so separate from nature they don't realize that's where they come from and that's actually home. But when you see people who've actually experienced and had a chance to be immersed in nature and not kind of the isolated wilderness experience that we're often shown, an incredible transformation happens. I mean I've had people come and experience emotions they've never experienced before. Um, I've had people, uh, particularly people who might be grieving a lot or I had one woman took to this waterfall in Colorado on this particular trip and she had suffered a great amount of abuse and hurt in her life and all of a sudden by this waterfall she opened up and cried in ways she never had cried and afterwards she told me this she said um, I needed something this beautiful to hold pain this deep Wow! and that is a kind of appreciation for the environment and nature that people don't understand. That nature is there for us to heal. And indigenous people knew this, that when people were having a difficult time, uh, part of their healing would to be out in nature. In fact, even the word asylum, even in the Middle Ages they did this. When you were having a hard time, you went to the monastery for asylum, hung out with the monks, had some nice food, walked around the garden, and just relaxed in nature. And that was inherently healing. That's very interesting. I'm really curious about this. I read about uh, Jed Scott Swift, uh, the director of the Center for Eco-Psychology. Um, he said that areas of interest to eco-psychologists include effective environmental education, which we talked about a little bit, and action ecotherapy with the, uh, the healing initiatory influences of encounter with wild nature. Now, you were talking about the vision quest, and we were talking about that a little bit, but what exactly is the vision quest? And if someone would like to get involved in it, how do they do that? Great question, and in fact, uh, where Scott works is Naropa University, and I have a very dear friend who works there as well. And a lot of the Do you know him personally? I don't know Scott, but I know a okay. lot of, we have a lot of friends in common. And um, one of my dearest teachers in this area, a psychologist in Durango, Colorado, um, who also is probably part of one of the largest um, programs in educationally to help with these kinds of programs, such as the Vision, Vision Quest, uh, runs the Animus Valley Institute, and they can find out about that at uh, avi.org on the internet. avi.org. avi.org. Okay. And uh, also he has a book called Soulcraft, which is wonderful, um, which also talks about this. Um, I have a little bit of, of the Vision Quest talked about in a book ever flowing on, and the idea is there are many different kinds of rites of passage throughout all cultures. In fact, our culture is strange because it's the only one that doesn't have established initiatory rites involving wilderness and solitude and usually fasting um, compared to all of the cultures on the earth. You find it in even ancient Judeo-Christian tradition. I mean, Jesus fasting in the desert was a vision quest. He was finding okay. out what God had in mind for him to do. So with the modern vision quest, the idea is going alone into nature, 
um, usually with a guide, but ultimately guide is to get you simply to a place where you can open your heart and open your mind and find out who you are and where you're going. The idea is that each one of us has a soul print as individually unique as a fingerprint. And that soul print could be likened to an acorn. And that's why it's such a great ecological idea. And in our culture, we don't ask that question of what kind of tree am I? Okay. Instead, what happens is we've been trying to bear pears all of our life and we're really an apple tree. <laughs> so the idea without an initiatory right, you're never asking that question of what kind of tree am I? What kind of essence did I come to this earth with? And eco-psychology is simply looking at nature very simply and seeing that we are nature. Now when you go on one of these vision quests and you're looking for this answer as to what kind of tree you are, are there exercises you do out there or you do you just go out there and just basically commune with nature or is there something you would actively have your patients doing? There is elaborate different traditions. Usually there are definitely what kind of be called soul tasks, um, which are questions to sit with, to question with. And these are not simple questions, things like um, uh, what in me is needing to die and needs to die? What in me is needing to be born and is trying to be born? What phase or dimension or part of my life is coming to an end? And what is it that I'm growing into, my next chapter of my life? Um, is very much the idea of kind of like a snake shedding a skin or a butterfly going in a cocoon. Um, or, or, and, and this is a time of deep preparation. So yes, there's a lot of preparation, a lot of things you do on the quest. But we also kind of say once somebody prepares, once they go out, forget all of that intellectually. But many times people prepare anywhere from three months to a year to go on the vision quest. So as they, they prepare in, in advance. Correct. And then, but what happens once they go there? Oh, that's a mystery. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you, you can't know unless you go on one. Um, there are some basic things that are talked about, but that experience between you and nature and yourself, you know, your soul, your heart, is something that's personal, unique, and individual, and always is something different. I know that I was going through um, kind of a tough time in 1987 and had the opportunity. I wasn't living here at the time. I, my husband's in the Navy. We were stationed somewhere else, but I had the opportunity to come back here by myself, no husband, no kids, and I took four days by myself and I went camping at Fort mm -hmm. Pickens. When I drove onto the island, when I got inside the gate at Fort Pickens, I started crying mm -hmm. because I felt the healing energy and I felt so much better at the end of those four days. Now, those of us who are more in tune with environmental things are more likely to maybe let some of this happen naturally, but we're gonna take a little break. But when we come back, will you please tell us how those of us who believe it's important can get through to other people who basically call us tree huggers and discount everything that we say. So be Love thinking to. about that. So we're going to take a short break and when we come back we'll learn more about eco-psychology and some of that effective environmental education. So stay with us. We'll be right back. <laughs> 